So first, let me thank Covington and Burling for providing us this extraordinary venue. Both David and I were saying, you know, this is, this is like, maybe we'd still be lawyers if we had such a nice venue. It's really, uh, it's really fabulous, and I thank our friends at Covington for, for doing this. You know, we're, um, we're in, I guess it's fair to say, a very interesting time in the United States-China economic relationship, one of, of uh, change, one of um, kind of almost a deglobalization that is occurring. Um, David coming here is particularly timely that his background in finance, in law, and working at Goldman Sachs, looking at working at Crevasse, Swain and more, two of in their uh, areas, two of the finest institutions in the world, and now taking the entrepreneurial path of setting up his own um, firm, um, which is 52 Capital Partners, which you're gonna have to tell us where that name came from, since <laughs> I can't guess where it came from. But um, he shares a number of things in common with me, one is being a lapsed lawyer, the other is having Jerry Cohn as, as his mentor. So he's gotta be pretty good if that's the case. But um, it's wonderful to have you here. He's gonna talk about the US economic relationship from the perspective of a practitioner, somebody who's seeing the capital flows every day, which is great because we often have discussions at the macroeconomic level, but not at kind of the deal level. And then we'll talk about some policy and then we'll open the floor to questions. But David, thank you very much great. for coming from the West Coast and being with us today. Great. <laughs> Wonderful, great. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for that. It's an honor to be here. And for everyone gathered this evening, friends, colleagues, uh, friends from Covington and Berlin, uh, it's, it's truly a pleasure to be here. So let me extend a warm thanks for uh, this great event. Steve, thank you again. Uh, the topic of US-China economic uh, relations is an important one. It's also timely, as he uh, said. Uh, the United States and China face a challenge of uh, great significance at the moment. Um, I see this day to day as a founder and entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. We are intimately involved with the current economic climate with China. It's also an extraordinary opportunity for the US and China. I want to address that this evening. Six years ago at a dinner in Virginia, my dinner partner, Henry Kissinger, asked me what I thought about the future direction of US-China economic relations. What is your assessment, Dr. Kissinger asked? I gave a three-part answer, and it went something like this. One, this is six years ago, one, I see a high probability of continued strengthening of the US-China economic relationship, with China continuing to accelerate the reform process and opening up its financial and capital markets. Two, I see some probability, not a high probability, but some probability of the economic relationship sustaining itself, but without meaningful strengthening and even a plateauing of the momentum of China's economic reform process. And finally, I can see a low probability scenario, not inconceivable of a low probability that the United States and China would retrench economically with even a rolling back of reforms in China. But that third scenario, the least desirable scenario, in my judgment, would be a low probability. And my dinner partner nodded approvingly six years ago. And so at least at the time, I drew some comfort that economic trends and the state of play in US-China economic relations would support that first scenario, strengthening, and short of that, the second scenario, sustaining economic relations and producing more measured reforms. Well, six years on, it's fair to say, Steve mentioned this, it's fair to say that the third scenario, a retrenchment in US-China economic relations and economic reforms has begun to materialize in the past 24 months. So given tonight's topic, it's also fair to say that I approached this evening's discussion with some mild trepidation. After all, how do we begin to opine on and predict the future
future of US-China economic relations, given the current environment. It's a challenge, and it's also a, a real opportunity. Um, many of us who've dedicated substantial portions of our careers to the cause of US-China relations find ourselves asking, how will the United States and China get it right in our economic relationship? And as importantly, when? And so tonight, I want to do two things. First, I want to discuss the current environment in US-China economic relations. And second, I want to offer several modest recommendations for improving US-China economic relations. Recommendations for our friends in China, and also recommendations for American executives and policymakers. My own belief is that it's imperative for our two countries in due course to restore a path of sustainability and strength in our economic relationship. And that needs to be an economic relationship rooted in free and open markets, a level economic playing field, a commitment to reform, and the rule of law. That's required for the long term, and it's also important for the near term, especially given the current climate in US-China economic relations. And that's what I want to talk about with you this evening. First, I want to address the current environment. I believe America's economic relationship with China has entered a new era. Uh, tariffs on both sides perpetuate an ongoing trade war. Uh, economic sanctions abound, financial networks and capital markets that I deal with day to day as an MA advisor and as an investor reflect uh, increased volatility. We see concerns around intellectual property infringement, forced trans transfers of technology, cyber conflict risks. All of this elevates to very serious discussions on both sides of the Pacific. In addition, we see today, 10 years on from the global financial crisis, concerns have begun to gather around the probability of diminished economic growth prospects. We're far along in the economic cycle, so there's some concern there. So it's clear that a range of issues have created a greater level of uncertainty in, in America's economic relationship with China. I want to take just a moment to highlight the tariff activity, and I, I know we, we see a lot of headlines, but I just want to just highlight this for good order, just to underscore what we've seen in terms of the tariff activity in the past uh, year or so. And, now, in January of 2019, 30% uh, tariff on solar panels from the U.S. washing machines followed. In March of last year, 25% tariff on steel imports, aluminum imports, subject to tariffs. China responded with 25% tariff on pork, Aluminum, 15% tariff on fruits and nuts. Last July, the US imposed a 25% tariff on $50 billion of Chinese goods, covering over 800 different types of goods. Cars, semiconductors, aerospace goods, industrials, chemicals, and appliances. China responded with tariffs of $50 billion of tariffs, uh, aircraft, and soybeans. There's a, a litany of these happening. And today, we calculated that, that, that our firm had increased with consensus over $360 billion of goods between the United States and China are subject to tariffs. That is close to half of all goods shipped between the United States and China uh, being subject to tariffs. It's quite astounding. Uh, this is something who's dealt with uh, US-China transactions, mergers, and acquisitions for many years. Uh, it's unprecedented. And so I just want to mention that uh, so we all take, take note of what, what has transpired. The political climate, again, as an MA advisor, the macro politics are very much interrelated with the current uh, economic dynamics between the United States and China. Advocates for US China relations appear to be dwindling in number in both the United States and China. And this is concerning, uh, I think, for a lot of us, certainly uh, for me and for others who have dealt with China for a long time. Uh, in the current climate, the major political parties in the United States who seem to disagree on virtually everything appear to agree that historical policies of strategic economic engagement with China have ill-served the American economy. In addition, a consensus appears to be emerging in Washington that a new and potentially tougher approach with China, one rooted in protectionism and containment, 
may yield better outcomes for the American economy and American workers. Similarly, in China, protectionist policies toward the US reflect an apparent trend in the direction of inwardness and retrenchment. I happen to believe that this approach by both countries is, is misplaced in the current environment. As I mentioned earlier, I believe it's, it's imperative, speaking as a, an entrepreneur, a founder, and investor, it's imperative for the US and China to chart a more sustainable path together that restores strategic engagement on important economic issues. And I believe we will get there eventually, and ideally sooner rather than later. But we need to focus, and we should focus on concrete actions from my standpoint, concrete actions and reforms so that citizens of both countries can capitalize on new technological innovations, entrepreneurship, and success to bring our economies together so we can continue to grow and succeed in the 21st century. I believe that's, that's very important for uh, private sector executives and policymakers in both countries. I mentioned earlier that the two things I want to do, one is address the current climate, and the second is to offer recommendations for U.S.-China economic relations. And I hope this is, uh, this is fodder for great discussion in Q&A after I uh, touch on these important points. I first want to offer four modest proposals for our friends in China, and these proposals relate to U.S.-China economic relations, the topic of this evening. And I should preface this by saying that my core objective always in offering proposals is to find constructive ways for the US and China to continue to secure peace and prosperity for both countries. That is the central goal, and it's always with that in mind that I offer these recommendations. So first, for our friends in China, from my standpoint, and I, I mentioned it this morning on Bloomberg News, <laughs> Uh, for seven minutes, and I'll repeat the same message here tonight. Let's get a trade deal done with the U.S. and soon. I believe that would be uh, catalytic for improved economic relations between uh, the U.S. and China. What do I mean by that? Why is a trade deal in the near term so important? The economic rationale is quite simple. The probability of continued short-term risks and deterioration to the economic relationship between the U.S. and China remains elevated. And a, from my standpoint, and working with multinationals in the United States, private equity firms who are dealing with these shifts in our economic relationship, a completed trade deal in the near term would not only reduce those short-term risks, it would also soften the impact to our economies in the event that the probability of diminished economic growth begins to trend upwards in either economy. And I mentioned this earlier, let's keep in mind the global economy is far in the economic cycle. And in any economic cycle, no one prevails in a trade war. And neither economy stands to gain, gain much of anything if the US and China continue the current trajectory of protectionism and retrenchment. So in terms of capital flows, day-to-day -day negotiating mergers and, and acquisitions and transactions across the Asia Pacific, it's very important for both countries executives of both countries to recognize that in a low growth environment, having tariffs and protectionist policies are especially uh, uh, ill-suited for uh, the country's economic relationship. We need to be mindful of that. We are far along in the economic cycle. Trade wars are never good, but it's especially not good uh, given where we are globally in the economy. Second recommendation for our friends in China, uh, we, can, we can quickly discuss this. Open up China's markets. Continue with reforms to China's financial and capital markets. Encourage domestic reforms to foster greater transparency, liquidity, and accountability in China's markets. Support the growth and development of China's biggest financial institutions. And in doing that, accelerate reforms to safeguard the intellectual property rights and technologies of foreign firms that operate in China. Level the playing field for foreign firms in China. Have faith and confidence that Chinese enterprises can compete effectively with foreign firms. I know Chinese businesses can because I've seen the entrepreneurial spirit and ingenuity of Chinese citizens in action. Reduce onerous joint venture requirements for foreign, foreign firms. I, I mentioned this earlier in this great podcast uh, with Steve uh, a little while ago. 
from my standpoint, it's unlikely that China will be able to joint venture its way into becoming a world-class industrialized economy. A world-class economy requires a world-class financial system. A world-class economy requires world-class capital markets. And in order to become a world-class economy, China needs liquid, free, and open markets anchored by world-class financial institutions. This part of opening up its markets, China's economy would be well served, from my standpoint, to continue reforming and liberalizing the country's property markets. Enforceable, transparent land rights are important to well-functioning industrialized economies. China has made progress on this front, but I believe liberalizing China's property markets would well serve the Chinese economy and the economic relationship with the United States. It's important for investors, MA advisors, private equity firms that are, are making investments and commitments of capital into China to understand and know that investors can reap the rewards of land for cultivation, property investments, and ownership without extra legal uh, expropriation or confiscation by officials or large commercial developers. It's very important for policymakers in the private sector of China to recognize that land rights, land rights reform and opening up the property markets in China would redound not only to uh, the benefit of the Chinese economy, but also better economic relations with the United States. I see multinational firms and private equity firms in America that have billions of dollars in cash ready to invest in China, and the legal system, the property rights system in China is a cause of major concern. So it's important for that to be a focus from my standpoint. All of these reforms would be good for the Chinese economy, it would be good for Chinese companies, and a net positive for greater investment in China, including investment from American multinational businesses and foreign investment firms that, that my firm works with day to day in Silicon Valley. And these reforms should be encouraged and welcomed in China. Openness encourages confidence and investment and growth. Inwardness does the exact opposite. We can't afford, in my opinion, we cannot afford inwardness in US-China economic relations. The United States and China are two economies. We need openness in our markets. The third uh, recommendation for our friends, rain and sh shadow banking practices in China. Reduce incentives for taking on excessive leverage outside of the purview of China's regulated financial system. Today, China faces a growing collection of domestic economic strains, an overheated real estate market, over-levered corporate balance sheets, and a lot of debt across China's financial system. And for many of us who lived and worked through the global financial crisis 10 years ago, dare I ask, doesn't that fact pattern sound familiar? Um, China's facing uh, strains in these parts of the economy, excessive debt induced by shadow banking that's really accumulated a lot of public and private debt across the Chinese economy. I believe it's very important for China's private sector and policymakers in China to rein in those practices. And by reining in those practices, China can reduce systemic risk to the Chinese economy. That's good for the Chinese economy. It's also good for US-China economic relations. And that's my third uh, recommendation. Finally, improved corporate governance in China. Requiring CCP members to sit on Chinese corporate boards only compromises independence. Not only that, from you know investor standpoint in the United States, it creates the perception that boards of Chinese enterprises might place party interests ahead of prudent corporate stewardship, focused on shareholders and other important stakeholders. I believe, and, and many multinationals, many investors that I work with day to day across North America, believe that the composition of corporate boards in China should be market-oriented. What do I mean by that? Corporate boards should be committed to attracting talented men and women across industries and backgrounds in China. And it should be done without imposing a party litmus test that is untethered to market dynamics or the actual skills, expertise, and talents of men and women in China. I believe that's an important uh, 
uh, reform that would be good for the Chinese economy and importantly, very positive for US-China economic relations. So I want to turn now to, to recommendations for the American side. Uh, this is a bilateral economic relationship. Uh, we have progress to make on both sides of the Asia Pacific. Let me turn to American policymakers and American business executives and modest proposals for my American friends. First, perhaps it's repetition, but let's get a trade deal done with China <laughs> and soon for all of the reasons I mentioned. And in doing so, let's tone down the rhetoric. Second, restore commitment to free and open markets with China. Trade wars yield many losers and few, if any, winners. Levying protectionist measure, measures may feel like a win initially, but it's short-lived. The negative impact of tariffs on economic growth can far outlast any perceived positive effects of tactical short-term protectionist measures. Third, this is, this is an important recommendation. Set a better example for my American friends. And this recommendation has two parts, two parts that can lead, I believe, to better U.S.-China economic relations in the years ahead. The first part of this recommendation relates to international law. This new era in U.S.-China economic relations requires a renewed commitment by the U.S. to international law, and that includes international norms and rules for commerce, trade, and sustainability. We all know in the wake of the Second World War, International rules and norms shaped decades of US-led engagement among major powers, and that was a constructive-led you know, engagement that you know, allowed the US and, and other major markets to become committed to open markets, the rule of law, political liberalization in developing countries. That was a very important part of the latter half of the 20th, uh, 20th century. Economic engagement with today's multilateral institutions and international frameworks should remain an imperative for America's economic relationship with China. And I believe the U.S. can do more. For example, I happen to believe that the decision in 2017 to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement reflected an in inadequate recognition of the substantial economic, not to mention environmental, benefits of the Accord. The Climate Accord is an opportunity, yes, partially symbolic, but also substantive to underscore America's continued commitment to clean water, clean air, and a clean environment. That did not go unnoticed by China, the withdrawal from the Climate Accord. Uh, it did not go unnoticed by China, the world's largest emitter of carbon. And I, I think this is an important point. I believe that you know, deal makers, you know, in both the M&A context, policy makers in the US will continue to face, face resistance from China in negotiations to reorient or reconstruct existing multilateral arrangements or international trade agreements, including those involving the WTO, if the US determines to unwind its own commitments in other important international courts, the Paris Climate Agreement being one of them. I believe the United States can set a better example in its commitment to international law, including in areas of sustainability, environment, and trade, and in doing so, China likely will have greater incentives to look to international law across the country's portfolio of interests and concerns. Retrenching from international law poses risks. Retrenching from international law heightens the probability that the US and China will resort to ad hoc, high-risk maneuvers in advancing their respective national interests in economic security. That can result in brinkmanship, not just in trade, and commerce, but also maritime and other important realms in our relationship. And that should be avoided. We should avoid brinkmanship in our economic relationship with China. The second part of the recommendation, again, this is for our American friends, the second part of the recommendation is closer to home. Americans can and should set a better example with respect to our own institutions. And by that, I mean setting a better example with American political institutions, media institutions our major professional institutions. I believe our country's civic life needs renewal, uh, and we, we should focus on restoring the integrity of institutions to uh, improve civic engagement across the country. I believe that's very important in the current environment, and civic engagement uh, should, be, uh, should be a focus for all. Gallup surveys have shown there's 
a lot of uh, you know, distrust of, of institutions uh, in certain quarters across the country. That's the media, uh, 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 politics members of Congress got a survey, had a recent survey that said only 8% of, res of respondents in a Gallup survey had a favorable opinion of members of Congress. And why is that important? And how does this relate to US China economic relations? We're talking about civic engagement and American institutions. How does that relate to our two economies and our future together? I believe it's very important for American executives, policymakers, or civic institutions to restore greater integrity in our institutions. Why is that important? Um, it's important to do that not only for uh, our own institutions in the United States and the integrity of our institutions. It's important for China to see that there is a type of trust and integrity in the United States and our best uh, institutions, our law firms, our investment banks, or our politics, our, our major political bodies. It's important for China to see that. And I believe there's a higher probability we can see more progress and more dialogue in China with respect to China's institutions if our Chinese counterparts see American institutions garnering the respect and admiration of, of Americans at home. And trust in our country's respective institutions goes both ways, and so I believe it's important for American institutions to see that type of renewal and focus. And I, I mean that with respect to the workplace, corporate boardrooms, in our streets, in our classrooms. It's very important to do that. Finally, uh, for my American friends, uh, increased knowledge of China. How does this relate to U.S.-China economic relations as such a broad recommendation of goodness? Um, it's a long-term initiative. It's a long-term endeavor, and we're so blessed to have shining examples of, of this here uh, uh, th th this evening. Um, simply stated, the economic relationship between the U.S. and China would benefit from more Americans learning Mandarin and developing a deep understanding of America's economic relationship with China. The number of American private sector executives today who possess any sort of proficiency in Mandarin is a small fraction of our total population compared to the number of Chinese executives with English proficiency. And there's no quick fix to this. I believe the American private sector needs to be a committed, long-term stakeholder in this effort in Mandarin proficiency. Why is that important? As a former investment banker, Goldman Sachs, someone who, you know, 13 years ago worked in West Wing at the White House, someone who's worked in corporate boardrooms, negotiating large mega mergers between the United States and China for many years today. My firm, day to day, this is what we work on. I will tell you, language proficiency has an impact in negotiations and in finding constructive ways of moving a transaction forward, moving a negotiation forward, and that can have a, such a positive effect, both at the micro level and, and at this macro level. In the deal-making world, I've seen in action the importance of Mandarin proficiency. And it's important that we focus on that. It's sound policy, it's smart business. And it, so I would say, if you haven't had the opportunity yet, start to learn Mandarin for my American friends. Start small, eight phrases each month. That's 96 phrases a year. In your second year, uh, move to 20 phrases each month. That's 240 phrases. Uh, in your second year, by five years, be conversational in Mandarin, which is a great endeavor. Tell your friends, encourage your friends, family members, your colleagues to do the same thing. I believe all of this would be extraordinarily positive long-term for cultivating long, uh, stronger economic relations with China. In addition to that, I believe and the National Committee is a shining example of this type of leadership and engagement. It's, it's just, it's so imperative. American executives should exercise leadership in encouraging their employees, their partners, their shareholders, and other stakeholders to acquire greater understanding of US-China economic relations. Encourage participation in conferences, panels, trade organizations, civic engagement initiatives that focus on China. The National Committee is, is an extraordinary example of this type of leadership and engagement. And we, we need to have more of that type of engagement and leadership at other institutions across the country. Look to the National Committee for that type of beacon of leadership uh, in, in engagement on important issues of US-China relations. Finally, share perspectives with your counterparts in China. What I like to do, if you run a, a business like I do, you run around a business, get to know a pure business or two in China. And if you're in China, get to know a pure business or two in the US. Set up a recurring calendar invite every month or two to set up a conference call with your friends on the other side of the Asia Pacific. I do it all the time at my firm, 52 Capital Partners. It's a great way to 
engage with peer businesses in your industry on the other side and encourage others to do it, set up those calendar invites, make it recurrent so it just reminds you. It's an extraordinary way and in the aggregate it can have such positive impact on our relationship. It's an excellent way of doing it. I want to conclude by saying I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist for the future of US-China economic relations. The US and China have many differences. We also have an extraordinary amount in common and that's especially true in our economic relationship. We need to get this right in our economic relationship. Um, I believe the current period is a test in US-China economic relations. Um, I, I spoke with a, a Chinese friend the other day, and I said it's a test. We could even call it a da kao. Da kao, a, a big test, a grand test. It's an important test. I believe the US and China will pass this test. And prioritizing concrete reforms and frank dialogue, we can go a long way in helping our countries get through this challenging period in our economic relationship, and I believe we will. We should avoid an economic relationship of attrition. Policymakers and private sector executives in both countries should seek an economic relationship of long-term mutual strength, strategic dialogue, and partnership. Those are principles that, at a micro level, uh, we adopt at my firm at, at the negotiating table, getting deals done with Chinese counterparts. And at the micro level, this is what we do day to day and working through critical issues in, in deals. Competition is inevitable. Any good partnership has competition. But competition is a great opportunity to grow together, to learn from one another, and to become better. And that's how we should be approaching US China economic relations. I believe the best is yet to come, truly notwithstanding the tensions and turbulence we've seen in the past few years. I want to conclude, I haven't said much Mandarin, and I promised myself, my colleague, Mark Suzuki, I would, I would mention Mandarin. Saying, there's an old saying in China, and uh, it happens to be one of my favorites, and I'll conclude by saying this. Um, Translated, it means, although we live far from one another, we are still friends close in spirit. I believe many citizens in the US and China are close in spirit. A vast ocean separates us. Our country's differences are manifest, sometimes in stark fashion. And our country's national narratives are unique. Yet we share the bond to find common ground and to work together on important challenges over many, many years. And I believe that's a spirit that citizens in the US and China should continue to aspire to in our economic relationship ahead and I believe we, we will and with forms like this I, I think we can make great progress in years ahead so thank you again for this great opportunity but we didn't hear where the name 52 capital partners oh, came from sure oh, thank you Steve I, I neglected to mention that uh, 50 52 is a reference to a sporting ground at my college alma mater Steve Princeton University, there is a field on campus called, there's a field on campus called the Class of 1952 uh, field, and many generations of students have competed on that field, and I was fortunate to play on the Princeton lacrosse team, the varsity team, as an undergraduate, and 52 for many on campus, if, when you say 52 on campus, anyone knows exactly on 52, we'll tailgate on 52, or we'll watch the game on 52. It symbolizes teamwork and collaboration, cooperation, and coming together. So I, I thought that would be a fitting, uh, a fitting way to, to launch my first firm as an entrepreneur, teamwork. Cool. You said advocates for U.S.-China relations are declining. Why? That's a great question, uh, Steve. I think there are Two main, well, there are many reasons, but two factors are principally driving the, the deterioration. I think one is the, the macro politics that we've seen the past couple of years. I think there's been a heightened level of suspicion and distrust, particularly in the policy making realm in, in the US and China in the past two years. And that has contributed 
to both new legislation and regulation in, in the U.S. and China that's you know, dampened economic activity, it's dampened mergers and acquisitions, and as a result, both in the business community in the U.S. and the policymaking community, there's there's less faith and confidence in the economic relationship. The politics has absolutely played a role. There's also a sense that you know, just dealing with policymakers. Again, I'm in the private sector, but in policymakers, there's a sense that China, for you know, 40 years, experienced extraordinary economic growth. China became a stakeholder in the international economic system, and many policymakers in the U.S. believe that the United States was uh, had an enormous impact. So there's a sense now that there's been an imbalance in the relationship. The U.S. has, from a policymaking level, contributed to China's growth for many, many decades. And now um, th there's a sense that whether it's intellectual property, forced technology transfers, or the, the playing field in China, the, the playing field's not even. There's an imbalance in China. And many policymakers feel that, that you know, um, the U.S. economy has um, has not benefited from from China's rise, and that's fueled itself into politics. Are they right? Well, I I don't subscribe to that view. Um, my my view it's a complex issue, and my my take on it, my view is China uh, China's China's economy has grown extraordinarily. From my standpoint, the Chinese economy needs to continue to open up and reform, and not just in the financial. system in China needs to be more robust, more transparent, and with that there will be greater incentive for you know, uh, investment firms and, and capital market participants to engage with China. That can redound to the benefit of our two countries. There's a sense now that when you invest, you know, I deal with Fortune 100 companies, there's a sense of, oh, we, we throw a billion dollar investment into China, where is it going to go? Is this is, is the contract enforceable in China? Is the IT going to be misappropriated, uh, you know, uh, where is this deal going to go? And there's a real concern that, you know, the, the domestic system in China has not appropriately uh, reformed. And the reforms in China have lagged the pace of economic growth in the country. So China's economy has grown extraordinarily rapidly over the past four decades. There's a sense in the business community among M&A advisors and private equity firms that the reform process in China to China's financial system, capital markets, has not, that, that reform process has not kept a pace with the growth of the Chinese economy. And there needs to be more reform in China, more opening up, more transparency, less shadow banking, more integrity in the legal and financial system in China so that you know, the, the maturity of China's reforms are commensurate with the maturity of China being you know, a large economy. And there's a sense in the private sector that that just has not happened. So I believe there needs to be a. You keep yeah. saying there's a, there's a sense. Is that your. I don't that's know. That's my view. That's so my you view. You share that view. Yes. So you're not saying others. Others. Well, Hank Paul. You're saying you, you, yeah. you think that's the case. I, yes. I mean, other, I mean that is my view, and, and others share it. Has, been, has there been a reversal of reform in the last yes. three, four, five years? In China. On in, the ground? In China, I believe there has been a reversal in uh, reform. There's been a reversal in uh, uh, a slowing of the pace of reform in financial and capital markets. And in other areas, there's been a, rever a full reversal in reform, a retrenchment. And China's gone backwards in reform. And I, I subscribe to the view that that's not good. That's not good for the Chinese economy, and that's not good for the U.S. China economic relationship. You, you paint the shadow banking uh, sector as creating systemic. Joan and Jerry are probably the only people in this room who, along with me, remember when money market funds were illegal in the United States. You remember when they were illegal in the United States, that the only way you could, you could deposit money in a bank, and it gave you, it was just two, one percent, I mean, it gave you very, very low interest rates. And you borrowed from the bank, 
then Merrill Lynch came up with this idea of, of money market funds, which actually your return moved with um, the actual interest rate in the country. So the commercial, you know, when you put deposited money with commercial, it didn't, didn't really move. It was just these fixed, incredibly low interest rates, which subsidized the, if you had a banking license, you were incredibly subsidized. Mm. When I see the shadow banking industry in China, so if you wipe out the shadow banking industry, what do you have left? <laughs> you have the state-owned banks and a few city commercial banks. And your SME borrowers, mm. your small and medium-sized enterprise borrowers, don't really have access mm. to credit. Mm -hmm. So mm. is it really bad for China? And is this a systemic financial risk? Or is it a risk as the country retrenches and favors state-owned enterprises over private enterprises? Is it just part and parcel of, you know, these the shadow banking is all private. And we don't like it because it's private. We much prefer Bank of China or Gongshan Yinhan or mm -hmm. Nongya Yinhan and all the others because they're <laughs> state-owned. So what's going on? Why is it really a systemic financial risk? Well, it's a great question. And I've thought about it a lot. We think about it a lot day to day at my firm. It's, I believe it's systemic risk because it's, the, it's an unknown, unregulated part of the market that has a value today and you know, tens and tens of billions of US dollars. <laughs> and that number has increased you know, by multiples in the past few years. And so while it might not be a ticking time bomb for the Chinese economy today, I think there's a probability in the next you know, 12 to 24 months that that number can rapidly increase to hundreds of billions of, of dollars. And suddenly, um, to the extent there's a, a diminished economic growth in China, we've seen the past you know, five to 10 years, you have a downturn, a recession of the Chinese economy, and suddenly you have uh, you have um, capital calls and issues with with, uh, with borrowers and lenders and lots of disputes in the shadow banking system. That is an extraordinary risk, not just to the individual participants, but in the aggregate, it can have a, such a negative impact on the Chinese economy. That is systemic. That is a problem, um, and you know, uh, so it's the it's the unknown risk. How big this problem can get. Investors are focused on this all the time. Shadow banking. I, my view on this is is really, you know, uh, twofold. One, rein in shadow banking, regulate it, get more oversight. Yes, it's it's outside the purview of the state-owned uh, system, but there needs to be some understanding of the the magnitude of what we're looking at in the market. The last thing the U.S. China economic relationship. driven by a blow up in the shadow banking system. The, the important point is, I believe there needs to be reform among those state-owned enterprise financial institutions in China. China needs more robust, more world-class financial institutions. State-owned financial institutions in the long term for China, there's a cap there. It's not China's growth as an economy, sophistication and financial capital markets will be limited if their biggest and, and best financial institutions are driven by, by the state or state owned. I believe there needs to be reform in the financial institutions in China. There needs to be an opening up of financial institutions, the biggest financial institutions. We need the Goldman, we need Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, to take your best financial institutions in Western industrialized economies in terms of openness, liquidity, accountability, transparency, we need that in China. China needs that. I mentioned earlier, China cannot joint venture its way. China cannot shadow bank its way into becoming a world-class industrialized economy. It, there is a zero, there's a zero percent probability of that happening. And so. What, what, well, my last question, then we got a great audience. <laughs> I want to open it to the audience. What if our whole, uh, the, the CFIUS, the, the stricter scrutiny from CFIUS, the passage of uh, FIRMA, the, you know, this whole series of legislation and regulatory actions in the U.S. to protect us against a rising China. Mm. And 
that's you know a, a China that may not be the responsible stakeholder that Bob Zoeck hoped it would be at our dinner in 2005. <laughs> what if our analysis is wrong? And what we should be thinking about <clears throat> that the things that you, I think nobody <coughs> in the United States is gonna argue with you on what your proposed reforms in China um, should have, whether they should occur. I think people are going to say, sure. It's not at all clear that the Chinese government is prepared to do any of those things. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Wen Jiabao, in not exactly a favored figure in, in China today, who, when he was in Shenzhen, uh, talked about we need economic reform. The country is not functioning properly uh, economically. And we need political reform in order to have that economic reform. Mm -hmm. he made, and the speech got very little attention, but it's, it's what he said. So what if our analysis is wrong? And that that analysis is right. That what we're really looking at is economic policy, which ignores 37 years of Chinese economic growth. That the growth came from the private sector. And now the shift to the public sector is not going to make for a strong China mm -hmm. and a rising China, but a weak China mm -hmm. and a fragmented China mm -hmm. and a China that has lots of internal problems because economic growth, which has supported the Chinese Communist Party's rule, is going to fade away. Mm -hmm. And part of the, my issue with the, the, uh, you know, the shadow banking industry is maybe it's good financial analysis. Maybe it's just assertion of state control and starving of the small and medium-sized enterprises of capital. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, wow, we're going to look not at 6% or 5% or 4% or 3% or 2%. We're going to look at zero or minus 2% five years from now, because the private sector is where the growth is coming. So what if our analysis is all wrong? Could it be all wrong? And we shouldn't worry so much about, but you said worry about a weak China. Well, I, I believe that a, uh, my view on this, um, and, and you alluded to this initially, the CFIUS review, the regulatory review map in the United States, and you mentioned this, and I just Strong China economically uh, is is good for the United States. We need to have our our two economies are not going away. We are interdependent. We are interconnected. Capital flows. I mean, we have less. Just just one quick fact. We have um, trade. You know, uh, uh, trade uh, between the United States and China. You know, Fifteen years ago was far less <laughs> than what it is. Today and 15 years ago, no one was talking about a cold war between the United States and China. We were interconnected. We were interdependent. I believe a strong Chinese economy is good for China and good for the United States-China economic relationship. We need to have strength, mutual strength, in both economies. So when we talk about the rise of China economically, the question is, what what do we mean by rise of China? Do we mean sustained economic growth at you know six and a half, six point eight percent? Sustainable economic growth, uh, commercial relations, continued trade with the United States. That should be welcome because the downside risk of a China that goes into a recession or zero percent growth for a depression that is, I believe, that poses far more serious risk to the U.S.-China relationship than just a continued uh, growth in the Chinese economy. Uh, my view is let's encourage reforms to uh, China's. Financial and capital markets, financial institutions. We need China to open up, continue to reform, and in doing so, become more market oriented. Not just shadow banking, that's again an effect of what the, the Chinese system is, but within China's actual institutions, regulated institutions, financial institutions, big banks, China needs to reform those major institutions that have such a 
and impact and influence on the Chinese economy. And in doing so, China will become stronger and China will become more market-oriented. And with that, U.S.-China economic relations will be more sustainable and stronger in the years ahead. That's good for China, that's good for the U.S. By the way, in reforming China's financial institutions, do you know what that means? China's legal system and judicial system needs to, needs to be improved and reformed and made more transparent, more accountable, more independent. That's vitally important. So I believe openness and reform in China's financial and capital markets, it goes hand in hand with reforming China's legal systems, China's court system to provide more accountability, more due process, not just for private enterprises, but also for, also for individuals, entrepreneurs, and just individual citizens. That's so important for business confidence, both for the Chinese economy and for multinationals. I will tell you, I will tell you, this may seem counterintuitive, multinational businesses in the United States, private investment firms in the United States, who look at the China market and they look at the legal problems, the judicial problems in China, and the lack of reform or retrenchment reform, it causes concern among investors in the United States who have billions of dollars in capital. You may think, what's the relationship there? There's an absolute relationship, why? Because if there is a specter of doubt as to the sanctity and integrity of China's legal and judicial system, private equity firms, investors in the United States, Fortune 100 companies say, well, why, why do I want to pour $5 billion into the Chinese economy if it's just going to be my a court will enforce the contracts, uh, you know, there's misappropriation risk, my IP, my trademark, patents, copyrights are just going to be misappropriated. Why do it? So by reforming China's legal and judicial system and reforming and opening up the financial and capital markets and maturing China's financial institutions, all of that will redound to strengthen the Chinese economy, openness in the Chinese economy, and greater confidence on the American side that our two economies are more analogous in how we interact with each other commercially. What does that mean? More cross-border investment, more capital flows, more confidence in our legal systems and court systems. That is, that is such a good thing for the Chinese economy and China's continued growth. Retrenchment and inwardness, I mentioned in my remarks, that China pursues policies of inwardness and uh, nationalizing entities and pursuing a more state-oriented path, that is, that is in the opposite direction of where China should go for China's economy and U.S.-China economic relations. So I believe it's, it's so important for China to accelerate and continue the reform process, both in their financial institutions and their legal systems. And in doing that, it helps our economic relationship. I see it day to day. On, I'm on the phone 24-7 with Fortune 100 executives, and they ask me this exact question. What is happening in the regulatory environment? What is happening in the legal environment? We're a private equity firm. We have $100 billion in assets. We have $2 billion we just raised. We're ready to deploy it into China, but what's the risk? Well, the risk is that their money is not going to be a good return on invested capital in China. And so they sit on the sidelines. And I tell them that. We have greater confidence that Chinese laws, Chinese courts, Chinese financial institutions are more open, more robust, more transparent, more accountable. That's fantastic for the Chinese economy. And we underscore that. And I think it's, it's so important to do that. China needs to continue this path of reform, pursuing sta a state-led path, state ownership, where party tests uh, dictate terms, both in governance and in, in transactions, that is not that is not good for the Chinese economy. It may feel like a win now, but in a downturn, it's the last thing the Chinese economy needs. And we need a strong China and a strong U.S. So I'll pause there. Yeah. Digress. Let me open the floor to sure. questions. We've got as the Jesh hour in here, <laughs> Professor Cohen. Oh boy, my mentor. online tomorrow. Wonderful, including the discussion. Uh, I didn't have a chance to take notes, but I, I made some. We only have a few minutes. I'll just say three things. One, this is an almost an hour discussion. I don't recall hearing two words, communist party. Mm. 
might have said CCP. Jim might have Jim Reed talks <laughs> about the party all the time in every context. So I think at least my second opinion is going to come to a discussion about business and economics and not have to hear about BRI. But BRI is highly relevant and it illustrates some of the challenges you're talking about, including dispute resolution. When we listen to the endless analysis now of all the problems of BRI, you seldom hear about how are disputes going to be settled. Mm. Are people really going to want to settle them in China? Mm. China didn't want to settle its disputes abroad when people started to invest in China. Mm. And China won't want to settle disputes in Pakistan or Sri Lanka, etc. Where, how are they going to do it? Third, I like your prescriptions, but we say heaven is wonderful. <laughs> the problem is how to get there. In our current depressed situation in both countries, facing fractured views of things, no unity. I mean, China, although it suppresses uh, dissent, has got lots of dissent. Many people agree with what you and Steve and others are suggesting. As you point out, it ain't happening. Mm -hmm. But this is a good discussion. Well, it's, thank you, Jerry, for great points. No surprise, excellent questions. And getting to your last point, why, why, why ain't it happening? The, the $64,000 question. Um, I, I believe you know, we, we need more advocates in the United States. We need more advocates for U.S.-China relations in the country particularly in the current climate. Uh, I believe we need to double down on these types of opportunities, panels, conferences, dialogue is so important now. And why, why is it happening? Well, I think there's been a convergence, Jerry, in terms of you know, a lot of sentiment in the policy-making realm, in the private sector. In the American business community, there's a lot of concern about investment in China, and policymakers have concern environment in China. Both political parties in, in the U.S. now, it's, it's stunning to me, um, agree on this tougher approach with respect to China. That is, it's uh, remarkable from my standpoint. How do we get there? Um, I believe it's important to have frank dialogue, and this is, this is critically important too, and I, I see it a lot as in you know, Hong Kong and Shanghai in, in January articulate it's fine to have uh, recommendations for reforms and you know dialogue and, and, and what have you. It, it is more important, particularly in this current environment, to make specific technical recommendations and proposals to policymakers in China with respect to these reforms. I'm talking very, very fine-tuned recommendations, technical recommendations with respect to court system in China, technical recommendations and, and proposals, that is a far better invitation for getting things done in this environment. We need to get things done and having broad communiques and uh, um, aspirational um, uh, messages, that, that there's a limitation to that. There need to be technical, specific technical recommendations and that, that is an extraordinary way to engage in dialogue. I see it in person and there's a lot more but to do that, we need more, we need more Americans and, and Chinese having that type of dialogue and well, getting really specific. Yeah, go ahead. You can talk about all these technical things, right. and I don't disagree. Right. But we haven't even mentioned why the American people are increasingly hostile mm -hmm. to China. Mm -hmm. It's not just economics. Mm -hmm. It's not just national security. Every day we're treated to headlines about China's denial of human rights. The Xinjiang Tibet thing, of course, is just unbelievably stupid on China's part as well as cruel. But the broader questions of no freedom of speech for even the business elite, even the party elite, and this is ventilated and the persecution of lawyers is all affects the business. You can't separate That's, 
a great question. I wish I knew the answer, Jerry, why, why there's not that recognition. China is focused on its economic security, number one. Number two, how do you ensure economic security? Well, China needs investment. China needs M&A activity. China needs FDI. China needs foreign investment. China needs American private equity firms putting hundreds of billions of dollars in the market. Okay, fine. That's great for China's economic security. It's great for China's growth. Okay, but what, what will incentivize the investment community, the business community in the United States to invest in China? Well, American multinationals and investors who see lack of due process in China for enterprises, entrepreneurs, and individuals, it creates a sentiment among the private sector in the U.S. that their money is not going to be treated fairly in, in, in China. So there's a, from my standpoint, Jerry, there's a direct relationship between questions of due process at the individual level in China, questions of fairness, questions of how individuals are treated in court, how individuals are, are treated on the streets. There's a direct relationship, by the way, between that and investor sentiment in the United States. Investors follow this in the United States. Multinationals in the United States follow the headlines in China with respect to you know, lack of due process and how party, how party interests are, are dictating uh, you know, terms. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a real concern. So if we want to see more growth in the Chinese economy, more investment in the Chinese economy from U.S. investors and other key markets, I believe it's imperative for China and China's leaders and policymakers to focus on reforms with respect to the legal system, judicial system, questions of due process, business due process, individual due process. That's, that's great for China's economy because it, it instills greater confidence and investors in the U.S. that their dollars and their people will be respected and treated in China. That's how I, I, I size it up, Jerry. As, again, as a private sector executive, that's how I, I see the relationship, and many, many agree with me. So it's very important for us to think about it this way. Tell us to the party. The, uh, <laughs> I'll the, try. Well, unfortunately, we're not going to have. <clears throat> we've run out of time already. I would say that to say. I would say that on May eighth. We will have a program which presents the data on Chinese investment in the United States and U.S. investment in China. It's a granular look at all of that. And the data, by the way, will show that while there has been a precipitous drop in Chinese investment in the United States as a result of uh, CFIUS reviews and a less welcoming climate, in addition, capital controls that China has put on um, has had a tremendous effect. It also will show that there has not been a drop off of U.S. investment in China. That we've remained at roughly the, you know, the eight. I believe it's the eight billion dollar level, and that there hasn't been a fall off, despite the fact that the anecdotal evidence supports what David is saying that people are hesitating to invest more. We could invest but again with, with yeah. trillion dollar, I mean, twelve trillion dollar economy. The amount of investment is. One could say is virtually de minimis. Right. It should have another uh, one or two zeros after it. So, David, thank you so much thank for coming you. from the West Coast to be with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.